Hey everybody, thought I'd do something a little different today. Thought I'd respond to some comments that were uh, posted on uh, the last video about uh, the best and worst of the Stones playing their songs live on stage versus the studio. There were so many great comments that I thought, geez, there's so many here that I'd like to address that I thought this would be the quickest and uh, most different way that I can do that. Maybe this could start a trend and I might do this more often. Let's go through some of these comments. First one says, always like the live versions of Under My Thumb. Uh, yeah, it's funny. That one has always kind of um, fluctuated between, you know, its own monster and also something very, very close to the studio recording. Um, obviously, I'm thinking of, um, well, the ones from like the late 60s, 1967. I think they were doing it then. And it was a very wild version uh, then. And, you know, I highly suggest people to look up anything from 1967, specifically the Paris 1967 show. That Paris 1967 show is really something special. Um, anything from that year is actually very cool. Um, and then, of course, there's a great 1981 version uh, that they opened the show with, um, with that song. And when they brought it back, like in 97 was the first tour they brought that song back they really honed it down to bring it to like the studio version and they had the you know marimba's um sound on it as played by chuck and so it was more true to the original version which was more laid back and um i like the chicago 97 version but anyway that uh, song yeah does go through its different um kind of metamorphosis um like all the stones songs which makes them um, special to listen to as the tours go forward you know um, next comment, uh, Glam Chris 12 says, Angry is great in the studio, but the live versions of this tour is not great. Um, I think I understand what you're saying. I I'm still figuring that song out on stage. I think it does very well, um, considering uh, it is a big sound on the studio. And I really was um, going to expect to see and hear Mick help out in the guitar department, at least in the beginning of the song when they played on stage. But no, he hands it off to Keith and Ronnie, which is a very pleasant surprise because usually with these uh, newer songs that Mick brings to the table, he will take control of the guitar work um, on stage. Um, but not the case on Angry, which is a nice uh, change of pace. He will bring on the guitar at the end of the song, which is an interesting choice. Uh, but I agree, the studio version does have, you know, it's very tight and it's very put together and it's a great sound. Uh, but I think they're doing a great job with it on stage. Jimmy Rudolphson says, Factory Girl, Flashpoint Live is amazing. Yep, that's a classic one. Um, I wonder if you've heard the one they did in Glastonbury in 2013 where he changed it to Glastonbury Girl. Uh, that's a fun one. Check out that one on YouTube. Peter Chexfield. Peter, how are you? Fave Live, Going Home and Satisfaction when performed as a medley on the spring 1967 European tour was unbelievable. Check out the bootleg from Paris 67. Great minds think alike, Peter. Going Home clearly features two harmonicas. First Brian while Mick sings. And then Mick while Brian straps on his guitar. And then Satisfaction has Brian playing with feedback, Hendrix style, while Keith plays the famous riff with a ferocity rarely heard elsewhere. Also on that tour, Get Off My Cloud was both souped up and extended and included a sizable excerpt of Yesterday's Papers, sung in the same higher key as Chris Farlow's minor hit cover version in the middle. Pretty much every live audio I've heard from 64 through 67 has the band on full throttle, a bit off key and on the verge of falling apart musically, but with a young, excuse me, but with a youthful, wired vigor not heard later. Sure, they got better on stage, had great, greater musical quality, particularly with Mick Taylor, but that dangerous proto-punk band from the Brian era were something else. So true, Peter, I'm so glad you waited on that because that was exactly what I was talking about earlier. Uh, I suggest everyone check out some recordings from this year, 1967. You'll be shocked to hear what's going on there. And you have to get over the differences uh, between, you know, what you're used to in the Taylor era and whatever era, because um, this, er this era is about energy and it's irresistible. I was shocked and I was a, um, I was not a believer before, but now I am. And I love listening back to those 1967 recordings. So check them out. Armando MPR says, for me, the definitive live version of United Rambler is the one on Brussels Affair. I can't argue with that. I mean, that Brussels Affair version is just um, out of this world. It's a different universe altogether. Um, but that Yaya's one still 
still works for me like the first time I heard it. It's magical. It'll always be magical to me. And it's just got the right slant on it. And it's, to me, it's, it's the Stones uh, perfected in uh, a 10-minute um, song. Next, Richard F. Wheeler, 2939, says, Here we go with my live stuff. Can't help writing when you talk about the Stones. Heartbreaker, Brussels Affair with Taylor and Keith, funky section. When the Whip Comes Down, didn't even like the studio version. Going to a go-go, Hampton Coliseum. Obviously miss you in many live versions, especially the bass line. When Jagger says, I wish I could play the bass like Daryl. A prime song that comes to mind is Can't Always Get What You Want, with the extended Bobby Keys and Ronnie Wood solos. The standout of all is probably Minette Rambler and Get Your Yaya's Out. One hit to the body, that's probably enough for now. Oh yeah, and of course, Just My Imagination and Beast of Burden also have in Coliseum. As a Stones fan, you know which ones I'm talking about. Thanks for your great channel. Loving it. Thank you, Richard. Appreciate that. All great mentions there. Uh, totally true. When the Whip Comes Down. Uh, I've always liked the studio version. Uh, it's funny. Now I'm trying to think back. I wish I could remember what I heard first. Did I hear the live version first or did I hear the studio version first? Um, I must have heard the studio cut off some girls and knew that this was a... Um, jam waiting to happen and then I then heard the 81 version the 78 version and definitely loved what they did with it I mean it's such a it's not you know on paper it's not much of a song you know but it's such a jam and it's such a attack on the guitars Keith and Ronnie will kind of you know come at each other and it's so great and uh, I agree that that extended solo um on you can't always get what you want um was good stuff uh, especially the 75 solo by Ronnie Wood. So great choices there, Richard. Thanks for watching. Appreciate it. Thanks for the comment. Christopher Lawrence, 2308. Hi, Justin. Another fun talk with Scott. Thanks. A point of fun, I hope, disagreement. I'd say the 78 and 81 performances of Honky Tonk Women top even the mighty single. 75, 76 is strong, and so is 89 through 90. But 78 and 81 are just wicked. Alas, the tune has been tossed off pretty much ever since. Not cool. Out of Control is a latter-day onstage triumph, and so was Back of My Hand in its brief life. Thank you, Christopher. Appreciate the kind words. You know, I'm, of course, you know, I knew that it was a blasphemous you know, comment to make in my earlier video when I talked about that I've never really sat well with any live version of Honky Tonk Woman. Well, that's because that's a testament to just how perfect that studio cut is. Uh, the crack of the snare on that and the feel on that it's just so uh, compact and so uh, impactful that it's just hard for me to accept all um, their versions, uh, which is, you know, sped up on stage, which is what they usually do. Um, and it, I think I think loses its um, funky quality. I think that's, that's what makes that track a little interesting to me, that there's a little bit of a funkiness to it. I may have heard someone describe that intro um, as it's funky, which you didn't, you wouldn't necessarily think about for that song, but um, I don't know, something to, to chew on with that. And Out of Control absolutely is a mainstay classic, at least the way they did it during the Bridges of Babylon tour, that extended solo. It was, to me, a latter-day midnight rambler, that song. And then when they brought it back somewhat recently, um, they kind of shortened it to like a, a mini outro with just a harmonica solo. But... Um, Anyone should check out the 97, 98, even 99 versions of that song. Good stuff. Thank you, Christopher. Next comment, Jimmy Rudolphson. I don't think they did Midnight Rambler as well in the studio version as they did live. Well, absolutely. It was just a template in the studio, which is, it has its own charm, the studio version. I love the way it's recorded. I love the way it sounds. Every instrument comes through in its clarity and its uh, intention. And... I just love hearing um, that recording as much as the uh, live versions, obviously bring it to a different place. Palace Revolution 2000. He says, I have wondered why the Stones insist on keeping the original key to where it seems to hurt the live performance. In my opinion, Rocks Off has never sounded good on stage. The verses in studio ride a lot on the harmonies. Without them, the verses sound disjointed on stage. Jagger never seems to know which way to go. Another one was Anybody Seen My Baby? In the verses, he had to dig low and then couldn't reach it in the chorus. Well, um, first of all, I thank you for that comment. I kind of see where you're coming from because 
on the surface, it may sound like Mick is struggling here uh, in these um, versions of the song, but I don't think necessarily it's a, a issue of the key because in both those examples that you mentioned, Rock Soft and Anybody Seen My Baby, both have the same situation where the register um, and the octave is much lower on the verses than it is on the choruses. There's that gap is always going to be there no matter what key you change it in. Um, so even if you were to um, raise rocks off or um, you know make it more comfortable for Mick, so the verses have a little bit more oomph, um, that would still keep that gap between the verse and the chorus in that higher key, and it might be even tougher for him to reach that higher key. Um, and the same thing with anybody see my baby. The point is. Uh, the key isn't necessarily the issue because obviously it sounds perfect on the studio recording. If the key was an issue, then the studio recordings would sound off, wouldn't they? Um, the issue that I think people are misconstruing here is that on stage, Mick and the band really can't help themselves to add a lot of energy to the um, songs. And so uh, when it comes to Rocks Off, Mick is so amped up and is so kind of ready to deliver that he wants to give um, those verses on Rocks Off um, a bit more energy. And unfortunately, that causes him to kind of create a wavy vocal performance that ha he has to really tame it down to really get down there to really nail that register. Um, and so that friction of the low notes and him wanting to really up the energy because it's a live show, he, that's just the recipe of the Stones. They make songs bigger and um, larger to reach everyone on stage, which is why a lot of songs are really amped up. So I think that's really what people are are misconstruing is that yes, it is a lower register that works against Mick on stage, but uh, I don't think a key change would necessarily change that situation um, because in the studio, you have a lot of things working in your favor. You have headphones, you can do it again, you can focus on the track, you can obviously do many takes of a performance until you get it right. And of course, it's focus. In the studio, you have all the time in the world uh, to deliver that vocal. And on stage, it's uh, a different intention. But I definitely do know what you mean on Rock Soft. Um, but um, I give them points for trying. It's a tough song to um, duplicate on stage. Next comment, Rolling Stones 911. I love the live versions of Flip the Switch. The studio versions seem to lack energy. I was surprised you did not like live versions of Honk Tonk Woman. I think there are many great live versions of that song. I wish they would bring back Brown Sugar. Yeah, flip the switch. I also um, actually think that the studio version is a little bit tighter. And a lot of it has to do with just I love the production on that album and just the way Charlie sounds on that track, uh, the way he kicks it off and the way his drums sound to me is just perfection. And um, much like we've been talking about in all these um, songs, uh, I always found the live version of Flip the Switch to be a little bit too amped up where it lost a little bit of its center um, and magic. But nevertheless, I've always enjoyed each version. Next comment, Wayne, 8768. I love this discussion and love even more all the comments. I look forward to tracking on all the live versions mentioned and checking them out. My beef has always been shattered. Great studio version with a cool staccato lick that got turned into a weird phaser lick when played live. All the grit from the studio performance was lost. Don't mind the maggots. Rocks Off is also a great studio tune that never converted well to live, in my opinion. Charlie, R.I.P., let the boys drag out that one way too much. So many of the strip tracks are amazing. Some really great work at those shows. Oh, yeah. Gotta love the stripped uh, shows. Totally stripped box set, which I hope a lot of people have. It's a must-have live set. It's probably one of their, it's probably one of the, the best live um, sets from the later 90s period some amazing cuts on some deep cuts on a lot of those set lists during those club shows. Good stuff. Um, I know what you mean about Shattered. Um, luckily, I find that both have their charm. The, the studio track is absolutely perfection, no doubt about it. Yeah, it's got this weird herky-jerky, um, you know, vibe to it. Um, and yeah, the live version is so, you know, straightforward. And, um, but nevertheless, it's its own monster. And for some reason, I was able to differentiate the two and enjoy both of them separately. I love that 81 version so much, though. Uh, one RWJ with says, I still wish they would do the intro to Jump Jack Flash even once, like they did on the original single. 
Of course, it is a different tuning for keys, but it's so cool on the original. Uh, I I agree with you. I you know it. It's so funny how they approach songs on stage, and they just decide to just lop off that intro, which uh, you would think they would want to milk. But again, knowing the Stones, they want to be the most you know cut the fat, and it's about getting to the point on stage, and for them to just go straight into the main riff um, seems to be uh, on par with uh, their philosophy. Um, but I also think it'd be cool to hear that intro. They did it really once, um, and that was during, um, at least, you know, during the later era. They did it during the club show for the 1989 tour. Um, you might know that they used to do these secret club shows before they would start start off these mega tours. And these club shows would be kind of like a warm-up gig, and check out the one from 1989 before they started off the Steel Wheels tour because uh, in that show, they um, Keith went into the extended intro like the studio cut, and it's very cool to listen to. Next up, Anthony ASWE4174. I think Rough Justice is so ballsy, nasty, and greasy on Bigger Bang. The riff, the rhythm, the flooding bass line that comes in underneath, the way the drum cracks in half, that just doesn't happen on the live version. It really should be one of their most played modern rockers, but they never seem to capture the same thrust that Don Was version gives us, and hence we rarely see it in the set. And you should do something on Keith's guitars. I actually love him playing those 335s because I love the sound of them so much. That being said, I too was very surprised when I noticed him going to those on stage more than about 20 years ago. I think they need a more screaming type of amp to come alive. The thing is, as great as, say, the 81 shows were too many times on that tour, the guitars just seem to thin and trebly. Thanks for all your great Stones content, Justin. I really love what you do for them and their music. Well, that's very nice. Thank you, Anthony. I appreciate you saying that, and I appreciate this comment. Uh, I agree 100% on Rough Justice. I don't think any um, version on stage came even close to that studio cut, which is so freaking cool. That's just the only way I can describe that that song on that album is it's a cool song and that's the way Keith actually describes mixed vocal on Rough Justice. I remember reading a quote where he says that he loves Mick the most when he's performing when he's cool and relaxed and re and laid back and he cites Rough Justice as being an example of that. And I think it's so cool. I think everyone sounds great on that and you're right Charlie comes through just so incredibly well and um, it's it's such a perfect recording. I agree. It was always kind of, you know, it, it was what it was kind of thing on stage. But yeah, it'd be nice if they bought it back. Maybe Steve Jordan could do a better job trying to rein them all in on that one. Next comment from Glass Slide. Hey, Glass Slide, good to see you. I think part of the appeal of the Gibson semi-hollow bodies when they play live is they're relatively lightweight. Keith has referenced back problems on several occasions, and I think those guitars play really great, though. I understand the arguments that they are not very Keith-like in terms of tone. My two cents, your mileage may vary. Yeah, I, you know, I think that's what it is, is that those 335s, and mind you, the one time where I thought it sounded great was on Gimme Shelter on that 1997 St. Louis show. I think it had enough um, of dirt and grit and scream on it where it was completely different from um, how I've heard that the guitar played afterwards. Um, and I know that, you know, Pierre and maybe Keith must enjoy the look of it, especially because, and the sound, because it, it must harken back to the Chuck Berry thing, which is totally understandable. But yeah, it, it's just, um, I find it strange when he uses it. And um, although I am happy that he's playing Lil Tina in this tour, I think it's a head scratch that he would use the 335 for this, you know. Uh, I wish he'd use a little bit more of a sexier guitar, um, you know, maybe one of the uh, Telecasters, uh, for example. Um, bring back the 72 Custom or that um, that other green one that he's been using on Jumbo Jack Flash. That'd be cool. But um, yeah, just a, a weird uh, thing to note. Reluctant Blumpkin. Interesting name. How are you? It was good to hear your takes on Keith's guitar choices and being perplexed by them. Couldn't agree more. Keith's Black Tele Custom Air is my favorite, and Keith using a semi holly body guitar to play Little Tina is worse than a war cry. <laughs> That's so funny. Uh, yeah, I uh, I love this comment. It goes back to what I was saying earlier. I probably read this comment before and it stuck with me, but that's what I mean. I think seeing that guitar on such a cool song like that is just a little bit of like a 
a mind fuck a little bit and you're just like what next comment devere 80134 live whip sucking in the 70s keith at his driving best and ronnie rises to the occasion bill and charlie swinghart you're exactly right i love those 78 versions and absolutely the whole band is just cooking and yeah bill wyman is like on the star, star of that show it's really cool Michael Brewster, 3553, love this discussion. It's always fascinating to me what works and what doesn't work live with the Stones. Some bands are capable of almost studio-like recreations of their work. The Stones don't even try. I don't think they're interested in that. Stray Cat Blues from 2005 Paris Olympia show is the best version with the Get Your Yaya's Out version, a close second. Both are superior to the studio version, in my honest opinion. Let It Bleed on 81, Let's Spend a Night Together movie also outshines the studio original. The recent rendition with Dwayne Dupsey in New Orleans was also pretty great. Rock Stuff never really works live for me, nor does All Down the Line. However, Tumbling Dice, Sweet Virginia, and Shine a Light from Exile on Main Street all translate well to the stage. I love that. That's so true, Michael. Thank you for the kind words on the discussion. Glad you enjoyed it. I like your line here. Some bands are capable of almost studio-like recreations of their work. The Stones don't even try. I don't think they are interested in that. That's it in a nutshell, Michael. I think that's well put and exactly the point uh, and you know there's a time and a place um and some bands just are interested in that they want to recreate uh, the songs that they wrote and recorded exactly that way for their fans and for themselves and that's fine you know it's like again some artists um and that makes a lot of sense um, but the Stones um, are about something else, especially when their roots come from genres like the blues or jazz, where it's about taking a piece of music and letting it breathe and letting it grow and mature and letting it take over a room. You know, not every performance is going to be like the other because we as people are not the same from night to night, month to month, year to year. We change. And so they allow the song to kind of translate through them. And so that makes them look at the songs a different way each night. And they're, I've always found the band to be very emotional. They're a very emotional band. Uh, and that comes through in their playing. If they're feeling excited and feeling very good, you hear that in the music. They're playing with a lot of energy and they're playing with a lot of gusto. And um, it's so clear. Uh, if they're not feeling completely there, you'll hear that as well. So it, they wear their heart on the, their sleeves. So um, that's what makes that band so special compared to you know, other bands where, you know, it's all about let's just play it the way we recorded it, which, again, totally fine. But for, for fans who are fans of bands like the Stones or even like the Grateful Dead or other bands that are a little bit more lenient and can bend a little bit, I think the rewards are huge. Next comment we have from Zill FN 9212. Sorry if I'm saying your name wrong. Nice video, three quick thoughts. One, thanks to Scott for the 1990 live IORR Germany version. Key solo is wow. I can't think of any Stone song studio or live on which he plays quite like the short, fast Apregio section he does near the end. He played so beautifully in the late 1980s. We all know the 1989-90 tours of the US and Japan and also check out his rehearsal jam in 1986 with Chuck and Clapton. Lovely stuff. Two, I do and don't agree about Let Me Go Live. The studio cut is a gorgeous medium temp song with a lovely country rock solo by Keith. The live 1981 booze and Coca-Cola version, while losing that gorgeous medium easy tempo, is blessed with long solos from Keith, who extended each night to cover Mick Jagger as he did his audience walkabouts. I love those long solos, which were always classy and beautifully played. Three, I wonder if Keith's use of the 335s and the Les Paul Jr. suit his more cramped playing style. The 335 certainly has a narrower neck than his more traditional guitars. And while I haven't played a junior, I wonder if it is a bit easier to manage too. Great comment. Thank you so much for that. Um, interesting points. I have not played a junior uh, or a three. Well, no, I have played a 335. So I don't know um, how much that's uh, affecting it, but I would not um, put it past um, Keith and Pierre to be the you know number one factor on these decisions is the comfortability of these guitars and it's all about how do we make it easier for Keith so I think between that and string gauge and 
tunings, all those things come into play. So great point about that. I do wonder maybe someone else who's played these guitars can weigh in. Next comment from McFly85A. Hey man, good to see you. Out of Control is great on the album, but it's awesome live. I've heard might as well get Juice live and it's not as good as the album version. Also, that was just getting good. You guys stopped. <laughs> uh, thank you for that. Oh, you know, these conversations, they can go on for a while, but we do have to be mindful of time. So I appreciate that. Um, there's going to be more talks with Scott coming up. So make sure you look out for that. Um, out of Control, like I talked about, absolutely. Those versions from the late 90s, were just impeccable. So great, so great to listen to any of them. You know, um, the one from St. Louis 97 is just magnificent. Um, but yeah, and you mentioned might as well get juiced. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> that is a super obscure cut. <laughs> they, which they only played that song once. So um, uh, good good on you to have found it and, uh, uh, and uh, listened to it. Yeah, that was from the New York City 1998 show, I believe is what you heard. And yeah, I mean... <laughs> That's a weird ass song, number one. I mean, that that studio cut is so strange. I mean, that song is very unique. I mean, that's, you know, I, I always applaud people who want to give the blues a facelift, you know? And um, that song is a very, you know, a strong attempt to give the blues a different spin because it is a one, four, five kind of song. It does have a, different change up uh, during the bridge, which I forget what it is now. It does get out of that one, four, five, but um, you know, it's got this synthesizer sound and it's got this, you know, kind of a slightly electronic sound, I think uh, with uh, Charlie's drums a little bit, but uh, no, that live version is a little wonky, um, but I give them points for trying that. That was a very bold uh, choice to make. Ed B Music One. Wow, very cool to see you here, Ed. Thank you for the comment. Love your channel. All Stones fans love your channel. Out of Control, brilliant live, but the studio version does not have the energy it has live with the crowd and the Glimmer Twin interaction. Yep, totally right, Ed. Um, we've been talking about Out of Control this whole video, and you're exactly right. Um, out of Control is something else live. But it's funny, I also love the studio version for what it is, um, specifically because... Um, that's Mick playing the Wawa guitar on the studio cut, not Ronnie, like he does on stage. And the studio cut is, has its own character, which I really love. It's much more cinematic and dramatic, and it's really a showcase for Mick. I think his vocal on that studio cut is perfect. It's really um, just slinky and dark, and it's got this attitude on it, and it's just one of his best uh, moments in the studio for me. So I think there's still a lot of merit and um, a lot of value in that studio cut. Give it another listen. And finally, our last comment from Psycho28461. So don't get me wrong, I love the Stones, but I'm getting to the point where I would like them not to play songs from the 60s anymore. They are really played out. I would love them to just play songs from the 70s to present. It would be very different for them to play songs like that, but it would bring something old but new to the mix. Very bold idea. Uh, cool idea. I mean, it's never going to happen. You know, <laughs> first of all, we all have to accept that because, you know, they all have to play, you know, the classics. They got to play Satisfaction. They got to play Jumping Jack Flash. They got to play Painted Black. Painted Black is their number one song on Spotify, which is kind of a head scratcher to me. You know, um, Get Off My Cloud, Ruby Tuesday, you know, they have to play these songs, you know, to really deliver the show that they want. But you know, the Stones have such a huge catalog that you're totally right. They could totally do another version of the show that has none of the 60s songs. And they could do just as well with everything that came after, you know, Sticky Fingers, for example. And uh, it would be a great challenge for them. I think they could do it. I think they could make that show work. Can you imagine what songs would that be? I mean, God... You know, we could finally hear, you know, Hand of Fate on a semi-regular basis. You know, Waiting on a Friend um, would come out more, I bet. And, you know, more stuff from the 90s would be great. They should bring back Saint of Me and Out of Control. And it'd be great to hear, you know, them bring out songs like Look What the Cat Dragged In or um, Dangerous Beauty. You know, there's just all these corners in this section of their career that they 
they just don't have the opportunity to really bring out and celebrate because they've got to, yeah, they've got to worry about these um, earlier songs that just have to be in the show. There's just no way around it. It's just like, you know, it, it's, a, it's a must have. But yeah, I mean, you know, we could, we could go on all day about all the cool stuff they could be doing, you know, uh, if they did focus on the later stuff. I just want to hear Dance Little Sister. That's all I want to hear. Okay, so that was a lot of fun. I really enjoyed doing that. I think I might do this more often. Really appreciate everyone watching and supporting the channel these last few weeks, especially with the tour. And thank you for your comments. Please continue sending those comments. I love reading every one of them, and I might feature them in a future video. So thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time on Hangfire. Fire.